What was Justin Trudeau's media strategy during last fall's election? Nice hair, good lighting, not being the other two guys? Yes, okay, all of that helped. But what was the plan? What were the tools? What was the strategy? Journalist Susan Delacorte knows because she was there. She had incredible access throughout the campaign, and she's written about what she saw in the new edition of her book, Shopping for Votes, and she will tell us what she saw in a moment. Wait for it. This episode of Canada Land is brought to you by Marco Viero, Justin Everett, Shirley Law, Chris England, Megan Platts, Tracy, Kelly Shoesmith, and Jenna Khaled. Jenna, why did you decide to be awesome? Because I think Canadians need to be more aggressive and critical of our institutions. Also, I'm working at the UN abroad, and I like to share the podcast with colleagues from other countries. And their response is always really positive. This episode is also brought to you by ShipStation.ca. ShipStation is very useful. Uh, they're a relatively new sponsor to the show. I'm going to take a minute to tell you what they do. This is for people who sell things on the internet and ship objects based on those sales. If you do this sort of thing, you know that there are lots of different places where you can sell from, from Amazon, from Etsy, from Shopify, from your own site. And it can be, it's really fun every time you get an order, every time you, you log in one of those sites and you see that you got an order, but then it's kind of a pain to go through all of those different places, to check them every day, to get the order information, to go print out shipping labels. And depending on where you're shipping and who you're shipping to and where they are, it's a different, could be FedEx, could be UPS. It all takes a lot of time. And in the amount of time it's taken me just to tell you that, you could have done all of those things using ShipStation. It will automatically import all of your orders into one central place, and then it will spit out shipping labels that are compatible with all those different shippers. And it is fine-tuned to Canadian shipping, which is a very different beast than American shipping, and it is compatible with all of our shippers. Go to ShipStation.ca, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage, and because you are a listener of this show, you will get a special bonus. What is it? You're going to have to go and click on that microphone to find out. ShipStation.ca. Try it out for free for 30 days. Special bonus with offer code CanadaLand. Check it out. And this episode is brought to you by FreshBooks. Also a tool for the small business person, for the small company, for the entrepreneur. I also love FreshBooks because they are a proud Canadian company. They're a Canadian company that's gotten quite big by offering useful things to companies that are small. This is accounting software designed for you. They are the company that I have used for my invoicing and billing for many years now before they were paying me to say nice things about them. I used FreshBooks as a freelancer. And now that I have a small and growing business, they are still the company that I use for my billing, for my invoicing, for my expense tracking, to get paid quicker, to save me time, because we are not yet at a point where we have an accounting department FreshBooks is our accounting department, and they can be yours too. Go to FreshBooks.com, try it out for free for 30 days. When you do decide to become a customer, tell them that Canada Land sent you, and you will be doing this show a favor. Thank you, FreshBooks. So, Susan, what what won the last election? Was there a policy, uh, an endorsement, an advertisement? Is, is can it can it be kind of pinned on? one factor? If you were looking for one thing that went on in the election, if you had to use one word, it was change. And, you know, that's a cliche, but sometimes cliches are there for a reason. And I I think the last election was a huge, a huge statement of, uh, and a desire for change among the Canadian electorate. And that meant change in style, change in people, change in politics as usual. Uh, and a change from what we expected, including that massive uptick in voter turnout, which was interesting. All of this sounds so familiar. The 2008 American election, all around hope and change, a lot of new voters turning out. And if you had to pin it on one thing, it's just that people wanted wanted something different, as we typically do. We did it a little while later. Yeah, there are some things we do before the states, but this one, uh, and, and you're right to bring up the Obama example in connection with Trudeau, because there was a lot of cross-border traffic between U.S. Democrats and the Trudeau team, and they were talking to each other about this very thing. Obama won because he persuaded people who had never voted before to vote for him, you know, non-voters. And certainly three, almost three million more voters in this election than in the last one shows that you that, that some of those techniques worked here too. You know, I'm just kind of 
recall from kind of, you know, media studies 101 kind of courses, the ways in which mass media has been discussed in like the last 50 years, really, and the role that it plays, whether you're talking about, you know, Nixon not shaving and putting on makeup, the perils of going too negative with an ad. I can't think of a media moment like that. I mean, the most memorable media artifact of this last election was the just not ready ad and that's from the losing side yeah uh don't forget it wasn't an ad but the picture of a young syrian boy lying on a beach changed the election too and introduced something into our election election that we hadn't had seen a whole lot in this country which was foreign policy being discussed as a domestic issue and an, and as a pivotal election issue too compassion toward refugees which which sort of morphed into the whole discussion about the kneecap and Canadian values. Uh -huh. So what I've been saying is, you know, the, the last few elections have turned largely on value for the dollar. But in this election, we saw a lot of talk about values, plural, of the heart and head. So for all of that coordinating and planning and metrics, and we're going to talk a little bit more about just how much of a data-driven campaign this was, this kind of left field issue. I mean, Syrian refugees, this has been an ongoing thing for a long time. The human cost, the human drama, Canadians did not seem to, to respond very much to this issue until that one photograph emerged. And, you know, we were involved in the immediate deconstruction of the media handling of that. And uh, Terry Glavin's story about, you know, finding that the file for that family uh, had it hit the conservative's desk, hadn't it? W w what was the ambiguity there? There was just vicious, vicious uh, information and counter information about whether or not that could be pinned on whom and whether the reporting was accurate. And more or less, it, it, it was with, with some clarifications needed. I think what's interesting about that is that, like, nobody could have seen that coming. That's the risk of running a long campaign. I think that, you know, the longer a campaign goes on, the more probability that something unexpected is going to happen. And, and there, there were a lot of those unexpected moments in this campaign, too. You know, who expected that, well, except maybe the people around Trudeau, that you could actually promise to put the country into deficit and, and spend into a deficit, and that would go over well with voters. And certainly Trudeau believes that that, is, that, that announcement is what won him the election. Yeah, if I hear the term outflanked on the left one more time, I mean, everybody seems so confident and authoritative after the fact, but it's it's easy to forget just how, like, this seemed like it was anyone's game, except for the liberals for most of the campaign, you know, like... Yeah, I think people have forgotten how low things were for them and how much they were being written off at the beginning of summer. Yeah. I talked to Trudeau uh, at the end of June last year and asked him if he was worried. I had been one of the few reporters out there on the road with him, and he said more people should come out on the road with me, because if you had gone on the road with Trudeau, you would see that what was happening outside Ottawa didn't resemble anything that was going on inside Ottawa. And I think that was a really interesting part of this campaign, the, the last election campaign, was the, the schism, almost the opposite uh, worlds between Ottawa and outside the bubble. And it was really interesting that that pattern was set the very first day of the campaign where Harper and Mulcair launched their campaigns in Ottawa. Everyone laughed at Trudeau because he took a few hours to get about as far away from Ottawa as he could and stood there in the sunshine outside with a bunch of people around him and you could have taken that picture from the first day of the election campaign and applied it to the last day because it it said Harper and Mulcair ran a campaign about what was going on in Ottawa. And Trudeau ran a campaign of what was going on outside Ottawa. Apparently what was going on outside of Ottawa was just like a lot of like overexposed sunshine, just lots of sunny, sunny... Lots of sunny ways, lots of people. They were connecting with people. I think Tom Mulcair and the NDP thought because he'd done a good job in the House of Commons as prosecutor-in-chief, that that was the audition to be prime minister, forgetting that most Canadians don't really care about what happens in question period, and they wanted somebody who made them feel good about themselves in the country, and Trudeau had been out running around the country doing that for a while. 
Maybe, maybe that's what did it. I, I want to get back to that in a bit. I mean, it's just after the fact, we can always, there's so many factors you could say, well, that was obviously the thing, but I, I, I'm not so sure. I, I was really interested in, in the new edition of your book to read uh, that Gerald Butts took Trudeau into uh, Benson and Byrne, this advertising firm, and the folks there, these are the folks behind the I Am Canadian campaign, the, the beer ad. They said that they had never encountered a politician who understood advertising as well as Justin Trudeau. I found that an interesting quote because I can't remember one advertisement. Like I, reading your book, like you, you brought up the one where he's walking up the escalator. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I think I remember that one. I, I remember the he's just not ready ad. Uh, I remember some weird ads where Thomas Mulcair was forcing a very creepy smile, but I can't for the life of me remember like a traditional TV ad that Trudeau put out there. So what did this advertising firm do? I mean, I guess they did ads. Did they, did they do anything else? And, and do you, like, am I just forgetting some wonderfully effective? Yeah, I think you are forgetting some. The, the, the I'm ready ad, apparently nobody had ever seen anything like the reaction to that in focus groups. When they showed it to people, people actually changed their minds. And it was Trudeau walking into the camera and saying, I'm ready. They showed that ad to a focus group of mainly older, middle-aged men, because those were the hardest sell for Trudeau. And they came away saying, this was great. People had never seen minds change like that. And there was an ad at the end of the campaign uh, from the Brampton rally that looked and sounded an awful lot like that I Am Canadian ad. And it was, better is always possible. That was a pretty stirring ad. Yeah. The ad firm, by the way, won an international award for that ad campaign uh, just a few months ago. Was that ad firm primarily involved in the creation of these 30-second spots, or did they have their fingers in his social media advertising? Now, the social media advertising was something else altogether. That was being done by his good friend Tom Pitfield, and the team around, uh, the digital team. Uh -huh. Although there's, there was a lot of coordination between the digital team and um, the campaign, the regular campaign team, I still think that most of the social media stuff was being done by the digital guys. Do you attribute, uh, and what is the consensus about the impact of that side of, of his advertising? The whole digital campaign altogether, I think what is commonly said around liberal circles is that the leader and the narrative, change narrative, won the election, but the majority was sealed by the digital campaign. Aha. Uh -huh. Can you go, go deeper into that? How, how did they kind of push forward to, to, to bring in the, is that about new voters? That's new voters and swing voters. And what the digital campaign was really good at doing was finding out where they were, where the pockets of strength were emerging and directing resources towards those places. So where a traditional campaign might have given up on a, a, a traditional conservative riding, you know, a, a liberal campaign would just say, we're not going to win there. Their digital stuff was showing them that pockets of support were emerging in those places, like Fundy Royal is a classic example. So what they did with their Facebook and digital outreach was try to find people around in the vicinity of Fundy Royal, liberals, to go in there and boost the, that emerging strength. So that's what they were doing in the last two weeks, mainly through the through direction from and clues they were getting in the digital campaign, which is incredibly sophisticated. They were sending the leader into new areas. They were sending resources into those new areas. So that's that's how an election win turns into a majority. You write a lot about how it's sort of like everything old is new again. You know, maybe I was too quick to discount the importance of some of those TV ads, and maybe I'm not the person that they were directed towards. Maybe it is your traditional TV viewer who is watching the national or CTV news, and the I Am Ready ad speaks to a preconception that a, that a previous ad, a negative ad, brought up in their head, and then that that's one kind of voter turned. And, and don't forget the, the importance of the absolute luck they had in buying ad time in Blue Jays uh, games. Uh-huh. And the, when the Blue Jays then went into the playoffs, again, a very happy time for Canadians to see this voice of happy optimism while you're watching those baseball games. I think that, that had a huge effect. And a 
apparently the conservatives and new democrats were were just not in that game all very court it's almost like co-branded the sunshine the blue everything that's exactly right yeah and, but then you've got this other thing happening where he's he's sort of you know uh, a retail politician the touring the country and and pressing palms but doing it in a very different way and you write about the the console can you can you tell everybody what the console is was well this is the invention of tom pitfield who uh, you know people with long memories will remember when pierre trudeau was in power his clerk of the privy council was a man named michael pitfield trudeau put pitfield in the senate and pitfield helped trudeau get his constitution through michael pitfield's son tom and pierre trudeau's son justin have grown up together so tom pitfield ran the digital campaign had a lot of conversations with people in the united states made a lot of trips to washington uh, and developed this thing called the console they guard it pretty closely i've seen it myself it's an amazing software program with charts and graphs and keeps track of how many doors have been knocked on in you know tiny blocks it has a huge amount of data about their voters it classified ridings according to how winnable they are which is not a new concept everybody's been doing that since the 50s the liberals grading system was based on uh, woods and metals it was uh, platinum ridings were the ones that they were sure to get and wood ridings were the ones that they were never to get and the silver gold bronze and everything was in between and then they classified Canadians uh, ranked from 1 to 10 10 being a guaranteed liberal voter and one being a never will vote liberal and they concentrated all their efforts in the middle zone there trying to get those fives to turn into eights and nines don't don't mess with the people who will never vote for you and don't mess around with the people who are sure to vote for you and I, right yes so concentrate on the middle so the console holds all that data and i've seen pictures of the console uh you know screenshots of it uh, on the election and it was pretty accurate in determining what was going to happen on election night so on the one hand you've got this you know old-fashioned thing of uh, oh uh, the candidate is in town he's at the shopping mall right now if you want to go say hi but the factors that led to him being there at that time in that community were, were very targeted and specific exactly I, I like the story Trudeau told me while he was doing the interview for this book that when they first unveiled the console to him, he is a he's a bit of a geek. I, I don't know whether Canadians realize that. That he, he he markets himself as such. When I used to cover technology, he would uh, he'd pop up on Twitter and you know talk about his favorite web comics or stuff like that. And there was always this ongoing conversation about whether he knew his stuff or not. I don't, yeah, I don't know whether I, not being as sophisticated, but he actually does love gadgets and and tech and all that stuff and he loves playing games and and he is a former math teacher mm -hmm. uh, when he saw the the console he was blown away and he said to them this is my new favorite thing I want this on my home computer I want it on my phone I want to be able to look at it when I'm on the road and as he told me that was the last he ever saw of the console because they wanted him to be that retail politician out there making the connection and not trying to do uh the digital strategy somebody else could do that and then just tell him where to go yes they've got lots of people to do that yes but he did tell me and this surprised me too uh until he elbowed somebody in the house of commons people probably didn't realize that he does he does have a bit of a temper right <laughs> it doesn't often surface uh, but i thought it was very interesting that uh he told me a story about going to an event, but this whole, the whole story is not in the book, I just sort of summarized it, but he went to an event and people were surrounding him, sticking close to him rather than getting data, contact information from the people who had attended, and he was furious. Yeah. Uh, that is the way to make him angry, uh -huh. is to not get data. I covered his uh, leadership, I wrote an e-book about it, and I actually went to spent a, a couple of days at Trudeau headquarters down in Toronto and they they were cheap they didn't pay for much by way of labor it was all volunteers the thing they did pay people to do though was to enter data collected at rallies and stuff into the database right they have known for years now they were only going to get into the political marketing game if they got as good as the conservatives and new democrats who were way ahead and if not better it was interesting when, uh, at the last convention, when they dropped the $10 membership fee, and, you know, it's almost like a, 
a Silicon Valley concept that no matter how small the fee is, it represents major friction. And if you r remove friction points, you, you remove bottlenecks, then you can drastically increase conversions. Yep, somebody's email address, it is very true, I think people have finally caught on to this, that an email address in the hands of a political party is far more valuable than $10. They'll spend a lot more than $10 trying to get a liberal member, right? So if they just drop the fee. It's the same principle that everybody sees at the store, which is, you know, much to your annoyance when you go and try to check out of a big box store or at the mall and they ask you for your email address and offer you a coupon. Yeah. You know, uh, it's worth the money they're, they're losing by giving you that discount if they've got your email address. So lots of sophisticated stuff you talk about, including, you know, the use of A-B testing mm -hmm. in their social media advertising where, you know, you can really slice and dice different demographics and then you can see what's most effective and you can even test out campaigns. You talk about how... They were doing that all the time, yes. Yeah. Now, that, that kind of raised an eyebrow with me because when you, you... You write about how, for instance, they, they experimented with negative ads and they had one kind of grayscale ad yes. attacking the conservatives and then one in color. And they found that the backlash to the grayscale ad outweighed the value of whatever you gained by making these criticisms. But if you if you present the same information in color, the backlash is, is drastically diminished. That's right, yeah. Uh, to, uh, yeah, that was a story, I think, from Kate Purchase. So my question there is that it assumes a playing field where you can do all these sophisticated things and there is no opponent who can kind of try to judo flip you or use any of it against you. We do a lot of screen caps over here. When people try little things out or make mistakes, we take a record of that. And, you know, if the liability of a negative ad is that your opponents will say, well, look at them, they went negative, and this really cuts uh, the whole sunny ways thing. Isn't there a huge risk in just getting that out there in a public way at all? And, and where were the other two parties in terms of disassembling these sophisticated techniques and, and, you know, kind of trying to turn them back against the liberals? A lot of things we remember as negative ads in the past never actually did make it to TV. You know, the soldiers with guns in our cities, the old liberal one against Stephen Harper in mm -hmm. 2005, that never made it to air. It was just, uh, it was a trial one sort of leaked out. But you can make a meal out of it. You could say, here is a negative ad from the liberals. And they did, yes, you'll recall. Um, I think that's a really good point. All of the parties are doing this, by the way. I, I don't think the Liberals were ahead on that one. I think the Conservatives and New Democrats were trying things out as well. The New Democrats, I should say, have also uh, worn a, a path in the border between uh, Washington and, and Canada the last few years. And it was interesting to see the way the old Obama folks, some of them went with the New Democrats and some of them went with the Liberals to serve as advisors. I would love to hear a conversation between all of them after. Good idea. Yeah, they're, they are all doing that, too. So maybe, you know, because they all know they're doing it, they don't really monitor as closely or who knows? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, maybe they don't want to turn it on them. But no, I think they would take every advantage they could. Maybe it just hasn't caught up yet. Yeah. You know what is incredibly absent from this conversation? When we When we try to kind of read the tea leaves, what can we attribute this to? We haven't talked about, like, the mainstream media coverage at all. Was this like the least impactful election cycle ever for the Canadian political press? I still think there was a role. I, I hear that CBC was doing, like that the hits to their website in the dog days of summer were, were astounding. You know, that CBC politics website was hopping. I, I think people have forgotten the Prime Minister did an interview with Rosie Barton that scarred him so much that he he shut down all his <laughs> interviews uh, for the rest of the campaign. The length of the campaign was an issue, the cost of the campaign was an issue, the depleted newsrooms was a, an issue, but I think that the media did a lot of good work during this campaign too. And it, it there still was the digital campaign and there was a whole conversation happening there, but I think they're far more integrated now. Like I. I, I think we tend not to treat the digital campaign and the digital messages mm -hmm. as separate anymore. It's just part of the whole story. I, yeah, I, I'm not really suggesting that the good work wasn't done as much as did it matter. And were we listening to these messages from the media, these these feature interviews and these endorsements? And I think we should probably declare that endorsements are over. <laughs> that, uh, <laughs> I, I think, you know, maybe the swan song for them should be that strange Globe and Mail 
editorial. Yeah. And then the and then the, the the post media endorsements debacle, and then the the, the censored coin like endorsements mm-hmm. endorsements lost this election. Definitely, yeah. No, it wasn't uh, more than anyone else, maybe. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, it, I, I've always wondered, and I'm a newspaper person. I've always wondered why newspapers feel they have to endorse someone. You know, it's I'm not sure that that sways any votes. Yeah. For the journalists, I remember you know I remember being on campaigns whether, and feeling kind of icky because you had this editorial thing following you around then so you were seen as either too friendly or too hostile yeah it would make your complicate your work i guess yeah it's there it's impossible to tell, tell some politicians that the journalist on the campaign bus actually has nothing to do with what's on that editorial page let, let me argue against myself i guess for a moment here <laughs> and suggest that the mainstream press may have played a very powerful role in this election maybe even a decisive role and I'm not referring to the endorsements, and I'm not referring to the big feature interviews with each candidate except for Mulcair in the Globe and Mail or the Rosie Barton interview or any of that stuff. I think that when you really look at what did the electorate look to the media for in this election, I would suggest that, getting back to your original point, that what everybody wanted or what the majority wanted was change. And the distinction for a lot of people between the liberals and the NDP was not that important. But what they wanted to know was if they wanted a change, who should they vote for, liberal or NDP? And at some late moment, after all of these dramas that we paid such close attention to, at a late moment before going to vote, people turned to the newspaper or clicked online and took their cues from what the media was saying was the right opposition party to boot Harper out. And with that in mind, I think there is a really interesting question to be asked about the decisiveness with which the media turned against the NDP in those late stages. And I, I think that that might have had a huge impact. Yeah, the same the same thing was said about the polling industry too, right? That um, Yeah, and uh, as read through the newspapers, I guess, but yeah, I mean... Uh, yeah, definitely. I, I remember, I was really struck by a few things. I went to Toronto the second week of the campaign to just sort of stand on the street and hear the sound of the campaign. Now, granted, Toronto is not typical of a lot of places, but I was really struck by, A, how many people knew there was an election going on in the middle of summer, and also how many were saying, I'm going to wait and make up my mind in October. You know, that the idea that there was, you know, anybody had votes solidly behind them was, it, that was just gone in this election. You know, that, that anybody could have won, everybody had a chance, every party for a while in the campaign was number one in the polls. Yeah. So it shows you that Canadians are now a very fickle lot, and yes, they need some information and clues about where to place their bets. And were they getting that from the media? Were they getting that from the pollsters? Were they getting that from advertising? I agree with you, yes, that the media had some role to play in that, maybe an important role, but we haven't done a really good job in the Canadian political science industry of yet of figuring out what actually makes people vote and where they're getting their information. Sometimes there's some evidence that more people get their information from advertising than they do the media. So while you may be a media junkie, a lot of Canadians don't even look at political news and their information may have come from those ads they were seeing in Blue Jays games. So I know they got their a lot of information that way, but I mean the the pivotal information I think for for you know for a lot of people I knew was just you know it's going to go red or orange for me, and I don't care which mm-hmm. so much, uh, and I just need to know which. And I, I watched it happen that you know we talk about how like you know you write about how Jenny Byrne was saying we made a big mistake with the Nakab thing by targeting the NDP. Mm-hmm. It's sort of a chicken and the egg thing because once the NDP took their, their beats in Quebec and then the math didn't work out for them anymore, that's when all of the pundits started to say, well, regardless of what the polls say, the NDP can't win now. Yeah. Um, or, you know, the, the, the polls are strong for the you know, they're, they're, they're suffering in Quebec and that means that they can't win anything. And then once that message that this was impossible caught on, yeah. you could just sort of see the column inches that were dedicated to anything positive about Mulcair disappear. And then this, this consensus reality was built that this is an impossible dream. 
argument if you want a viable alternative to Harper, it's got, it's got to be liberal. Yeah, yeah, I think so. But you could look at that as just the, the mirror image of what happened in 2011. Uh, liberals during that campaign will tell you that they suddenly this idea that Jack Layton was a viable candidate came out of nowhere to them and, you know, chased them to third place. Yeah. And it it is true that things seem to move at a glacier's pace during an election, then all of a sudden everything moves. And again, as you say, is it chicken and egg? Who knows? Does the media start it? Is the media picking up on something out there? It's hard to tell. Well, this is fascinating. Uh, I thank you for this conversation. And I, I, I guess I just want to like leave by touching on what is probably a, a, a big enough topic for a whole other conversation. But it's what we spoke about last time. The first time you were on the show, we, we talked about Harper's control of the press and just how different it was covering Ottawa mm-hmm. under that administration. In, in these not quite so early days of the Liberal government, what's your perspective on that? Has this been a reset Uh, Is it back to a better time in terms of press access, or what are your thoughts? It's a reset, certainly, um, but it's not back to a previous time. There, for all kinds of reasons, we are not going back to the kind of access we had even 10 years ago. First of all, some of the institutional memory of how that existed is gone. I think people have become accustomed to simply less access, and, and reviving it is going to be difficult, as a lot of us predicted. Second, the, the, the ranks of the media have depleted. Yeah. There simply aren't the people in the bureaus anymore to, to, to get and use the kind of access that we had 10 years ago. You know, the, the Toronto Star Bureau was three times as large when I was bureau chief 10 years ago than it is now. Even if the access was offered, I'm not sure anybody has the resources to use it. Oh, that is a terrible, terrible truth, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yeah. Wow. I never even thought about that. The focus is not, it's not so much on, on the grinding of the access. We, we couldn't even use it if we had it. That's right. Yeah. I think that that is a, a very sad truth. And, and the dead, there are so many more deadlines now. Like even 10 years ago, there was basically for, mm-hmm. for most reporters, one deadline a day. Now we are in the multiple deadline the, uh, universe. And reporters can't sit for two hours outside cabinet as we all used to, because they've got they're expected to be doing something else then as well. So all that access that we would get waiting around after cabinet meetings to talk to cabinet ministers, where's the time to to do that? That's your Canada Land. I hope you enjoyed it. You can email me. I read everything you send me and I respond when I can, and you can reach me at jesse at canadalandshow.com. We're on Twitter at CanadaLand. Our website is canadalandshow.com. Our crowdfunding site is at patreon.com slash canadaland. The next episode of Canada Land Commons will come out on Tuesday, and the next episode of Shortcuts comes out on Thursday. I make this show with Katie Jensen. We syndicate the show for free, for free to community and campus radio stations across the country, and Russell Gragg takes care of that. If you like what we do, please support us. Mm